This is all about the art of afternoon tea and what it means to us British, as well as what to expect on the menu and a few hints and tips on how to get the very best out of this national obsession. Tea was discovered, so the story goes, back in China around 2737 BC. The Emperor Shen Nong was resting in the shade of the Camellia sinensis tree when a leaf fluttered down into his cup of hot water. This small leaf went on to conquer the world. Afternoon tea is usually taken around four or five o'clock and here are a few essential components. The first being, of course, tea. Although many people use tea bags, it's always best to use fresh brewed loose leaf, usually an Indian or Chinese blend, to get the best flavour. There's a vast range of tea from single estate to blends, but here are some of the many kinds served at Fortnum's where we are today. White Peony King Tea, Nanping Yellow Bud Tea, Finest Gukara Tea, Royal Blend Tea. Then the cakes, of course. A Bakewell tart, perhaps, or a lemon drizzle cake. Scones are also a must. Light, golden and fluffy, slathered with clotted cream and jam. And sandwiches. The crust cut off, filled with smoked salmon, chicken, cucumber, ham and cheese, or egg mayonnaise. One of the things that defines this tradition and makes it so celebrated is its ascetic appeal, a chance to bring out the good china. The first teapot can be traced back to the 16th century in Yixing, China, made of porous, unglazed clay, but the art of the teapot is as rich as it is varied. And here's Dr. Andrea Tanner, the archivist at Fortnum & Mason, to give you a bit more background. Whether you drank tea or whether you didn't, the chief bridesmaid had to give you a tea set as a wedding present. They're brought out now from time to time and used. And it's fun if you have something beautiful, isn't it lovely to use it? But if you haven't got something beautiful, it doesn't matter. You start with the accoutrements, I suppose, a milk jug and a sugar bowl. If you have loose tea, a tea strainer and a holder for the tea strainer, a china cup, saucer and tea plate, knives and forks, perhaps a cake fork, preserve spoons if you happen to have them, otherwise teaspoons work perfectly well. With the table laid, the ceremony can begin. And how to make the perfect cup of tea? Well, the tea should brew in the pot for around three to five minutes for black tea, which is the most popular form of tea, and pour through a strainer into the cup to ensure no loose leaves are in the final drink. Add milk and sugar as you wish, but it's best to avoid milk with green teas. Buddhist monks helped spread tea around Asia while the British brought it to India. Now this part of tea's history is closely entwined with empire, colonialism, greed, injustice and war. But the East India Company, one of the first major tea traders, both rapacious and entirely unregulated. It began really just in the homes of the aristocracy. You had to be rich in order to enjoy tea in the 18th to 19th centuries. It was a huge employer across what became the British Empire. All tea, when Fortnum and Mason opened, was grown in China. By 1837, it was grown in India from the late 19th century in Africa. It gave employment. It has to be said, a lot of that employment was indentured labor. And it's something that tea growers, tea drinkers, tea blenders, tea sellers have to acknowledge. And it's something that we have to deal with. And we have to deal with it in a very serious way. But despite its murky history, tea remains Britain's most popular drink with an estimated 100 million cups being drunk every single day. When you go to a grand hotel or restaurant, presentation is every bit as essential as the actual tea, from beautiful cake stands to pretty napkins and tablecloths. I think our ancestors would have been horrified at that amount of indulgence. In Victorian and Edwardian times, you would have had something called seed cake, which had caraway seeds in it. You might have had a slice of Madeira, so rather a plain 
dry cake, some fruit cake. There are a great variety of tiny little cakes which are really influenced by French and Austro-Hungarian bakers don't really come in until the 1960s and 1970s. You might have been a little bit disappointed with what you would have had in Edwardian times. A debate still rages in England as to which order you should put the jam and clotted cream on your scone. And remember, scone like gone, not scone like home. Anyway, in Cornwall, they believe the jam should go on first, followed by the clotted cream. In Devon, it's the other way around. As to my view, well, I'll keep that very much to myself because I really do not want to get in the middle of a scone war. There's a lot of chat about tea etiquette, but really it's all about observing basic good manners and nothing more. When the tradition started, it was a rather more formal affair. Sometime in the mid 19th century, Anna, Duchess of Bedford, a lifelong friend of Queen Victoria, felt a sinking feeling in the mid afternoon. So asked a servant to bring a tea along with bread and butter and a slice of cake. She then started to invite her friends and a British institution was born. In a tea room in Edwardian times, it would have been quite a different affair. The ladies would have worn tea gowns. These were dresses that were specifically created for having afternoon tea and they were tea coloured. I don't know if that's because they were complimenting the tea or they were worried if they spilt any. Nowadays, we don't wear specific clothes. One tradition which still stands, however, is the hostess pouring the tea. And be sure to take your time. Afternoon tea is about pleasure and stepping away from the daily grind, taking a break from the hustle and bustle of everyday life, an escape, a moment of peace, a deeply civilised experience. <laughs>